Uh, I'm going to turn the time now to uh, Paul Edwards from the Wheatley Institute to introduce our speaker. Thanks so much, Quinn, and, and thanks to all of you. We're uh, really grateful to be able to sh um, work together on um, introducing a, a really great speaker this evening. Um, I just want to acknowledge as we begin Veterans Day uh, today, and we're so grateful, just a, a collective expression of gratitude to the men and women who have sacrificed so much in the armed services for our country and for their families, uh, often hidden the, the kind of sacrifice that the families have made. Um, my name is Paul Edwards. I direct the Wheatley Institution here on campus. And a few uh, thanks uh, are in order here. I want to thank especially Tammy Pfeiffer, who's chief of staff for Tim. Uh, Tammy um, and I had the opportunity of working together in Governor Gary Herbert's office uh, in the uh, state of Utah. And Tammy is a, a tremendous advocate for education um, in society generally and uh, has just, if you uh, understood the tremendous efforts that she has gone to to help elevate the importance of and the funding of education in the state. Uh, you'd recognize that we're in the presence of a great American hero. So thank you, Tammy. Um, also, Quinn, thanks so much for your help. And uh, Tara Carnes, is she with us tonight? But, but uh, anyway, has helped enormously on this. Um, as we get underway here, I just want to note, um, we'll be hearing a little bit about this in, in uh, Tim's remarks. There's a great book that Tim has helped edit. It's called The Call to Unite. Uh, again, you'll hear a bit more about this, but uh, take a peek under your chair. Um, not you, Tim, <laughs> but, um, and, and you'll have to really kind of reach and look. Uh, it it's, may not be super evident there because really. these chairs, but, um, there may be a little card under there, and if you find it, and if there's an empty chair next to you, go ahead and, and peek under that one. Uh, I know. Has anyone found one of these yet? No, not that, not that card. There we go, like that. See these here? What's your name there? Maddie. Maddie? So Maddie's holding up what you'd find. A few of you have found this. Um, and, and I won't disrupt it too much, but... Fill this out if you find one of these under your chair and uh, give it to me or Jonathan here and we'll send you a copy of the book. Wow. So I'm uh, happy to make sure that people have the opportunity to, it, it's, well you'll be talking about it just a bit, right? And uh, extraordinary uh, voices uh, calling for unity in, in our nation here. So, so um, at the Wheatley Institution, we believe that public morality and civic virtue and spiritual strength are essential to human flourishing. And we believe those values are best promoted through well-functioning institutions of civil society and adherence to our constitutional framework. And that's why we engage with scholars and thought leaders and students and the public to help preserve and strengthen families and congregations and communities. And it's also why I'm so honored to introduce Tim to you tonight. Um, Tim is a husband, he's a father, he's an educator, he's a best-selling author, he's a film producer, and he's chairman of the Special Olympics. Um, he's also a son uh, of, uh, of a Kennedy family. He's part of a, a, a Kennedy family, not from Randolph, Utah, like uh, uh, David M. Kennedy here, but from Hyannisport, Massachusetts. So I'll let you figure that one out. Um, Tim, um, as chairman of the Special Olympics, has really transformed the organization, taking it from um, a million participants around the world to over six million participants 
in uh, the Special Olympics movement uh, around the world. He's also the co-founder and chair of UNITE, and that's why we're here tonight, an initiative to promote national unity and solidarity. Um, he's worked with Hollywood to help tell some extraordinary stories on film and has been executive producer of films like The Loretta Claiborne Story, The Ringer, Front of the Class, and a couple of just real favorites of mine here. Um, Peanut Butter Falcon, if you saw that. Uh, such, anyway, just one of the great movies of the decade, uh, past decade. And working with S Steven Spielberg on Amistad. Um, extraordinary uh, storytelling. He earned his undergraduate degree from Yale University, a master's degree at Catholic University, and his doctorate in education from University of Connecticut. Um, has done a lot in the area of social and emotional learning. Um, it's co-founded and uh, I think still currently chairs the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning. Um, which is a real leader in the uh, effort to reform schools with that kind of uh, understanding about social and emotional learning. Well, he also noted that coming into this last decade in American politics, that we could do some better social and emotional learning as a society that uh, the ways that we're talking to one another, the way that we're talking to ourselves, has been part of the problem in the divisions and polarization that we have in our society. And so he's been working to bring together faith leaders, educators, um, philosophers, scientists, activists, and importantly, young people. And that's why you're with us today. And um, together, they're discovering ways to bring us back together as a nation, to find collective and common purpose that allows us to solve the important problems that we have. So Tim, because of your willingness um, to step into what is really an awful void of polarization that we face today, um, I think you really exemplify as well as any other living American, a, a very important principle that was taught to members of our faith, and you may not know this, but um, within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have a semi-annual general conference, and the, um, one of the leaders, President Dallin H. Oaks, gave a powerful talk just earlier this year about the Constitution. And President Oaks admonished Ad admonished us as members of our faith that on, and this is his quote, on contested issues, we should seek to moderate and to unify. So because of your exemplary work uh, for the well-being of our institutions and for civic education and for national unity, it's really a thrill to have you here. Let's provide a warm Brigham Young welcome to Tim Shriver. I'll get out of your way. Wow. I thought I was going to get baptized there for all yeah. of a sudden. I was, I was ready, like, because, and I was like, what's going to come next? <laughs> no, but more seriously, thank you, Paul, um, and thank you for the work of the Wheatley Institute. Thank you for the support of the Institute. Thank you, the young people, for coming. Thank you, Quinn, for encouraging people to minor in civic engagement. My whole purpose today is to get them to major. If, even if it's not uh, on paper, er everybody can have a double major in life. Uh, and many of you will have majors in many things in life. But uh, I think the part of the challenge of this moment is that in some ways all Americans are being uh, asked, are being called to make, uh, make a double major. And the second part of all of our collective uh, challenge right now is to major in civic engagement in, in a new way, your generation's way. In a sense, what I'm going to try to suggest here in the few minutes that we're together, by the way, if you leave early, you don't get the book. Just, no, just, <laughs> I know, you, nobody at Brigham Young leaves early. I know you guys are all so good. Um, 
But, uh, but more seriously, and, and I, I have to say, Tammy told me I was coming to Kennedy Hall, and I thought to myself, I had no idea I had family that gave a lot of money to Brigham Young, you know. <laughs> but as Paul said, it's a, different, if it's, a, it's a different side of the family. I am used to being uh, uh, associated uh, with um, the name. The, I'm, 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 fond, I'm remembering standing here the moment when I was, uh, uh, when I was promoting a book, an earlier book, and I uh, was in a, a hotel going to a book party, is obviously pre-COVID. And I got, got on the elevator to go up to the mezzanine, and there was a guy in a cowboy hat and, you know, uh, blue jeans, cowboy boots, big silver belt buckle, and about 6'4". And I was in my, you know, blue suit looking kind of uh, out of place. And he looked over at me and he said, anyone ever tell you uh, you look like a Kennedy? And um, I was sort of distracted, and I, the doors opened. I said, you know, I've heard that before. And he said, well, that must really piss you off, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel a little better here because I'm associated with a Kennedy who's on the wall and, uh, and gives me some safety, uh, I hope. Um, but in a way, it's kind of fun. It's a fun little story, but it's, in a way, there's a serious dimension to it. Um, and it's the, really the topic uh, I have today. You know, I, of course, the, this particular person meant nothing, and I, I didn't take it personally. But what he did do is what a lot of us do right now. He saw uh, a, a visual, uh, made a judgment, associated with a political set of ideas, and assumed that that visual, that set of political ideas, and that name were in some ways uh, unappealing, unattractive, uh, dishonorable, uh, who knows what else he might have said. Uh, lots of label-based assumptions about us as human beings. And I wanted to start with this image because in some ways it's the opposite. This image was taken by the astronaut Michael Collins. M many of you might have noticed he died last, just this past summer. He was on the orbiting module uh, when the lunar module went down, the orbiting capsule when the lunar module went down with Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong to land on the moon. So he took this picture and he was fond of remembering it as the only picture ever taken in which all life except for one person, was in the frame. Uh, so all of us, born or not born, uh, any human, any living creature, as far as we know, life on Earth, and the two uh, men in the, in the lunar module who are, who are just headed down to, to the moon, all of them are in the picture. Uh, all, of, all of us, uh, whoever was alive at the time, is in the picture. And this is what, um, let's see if I can figure out how to make this work. Not that way, not that way, not that way. Nope, next, try and, let's see. Maybe. Oh, now oh, somebody's helping. So this is what Michael Collins wrote. The thing that really surprised me was when he looked out at the entirety of life, it projected an air of fragility. And he says, I don't know why. And I don't know to this day, this was uh, decades later. Uh, I had a feeling it's tiny, shiny, beautiful, it's home, and it's fragile. Something about that small planet in this massive universe struck him, struck him about each of you sitting here today, uh, all of us in this university as being fragile, all of us in this state, all of us in this country, all of us in the planet that has no national boundaries. I mean, you don't see any of them in the picture. Rivers don't divide us. Mountain ranges don't divide us. It's just one piece of life. And its fragility reminded him throughout of his life of the challenge we have, which is now, I think, before us, uh, which is to figure out how to identify through our fragility our strength and despite our divisions, our unity. Now, let's see. No, nope, not that one. I'll try that one. Nope. <laughs> nope. There we go. So um, here we are uh, in 2021. Uh, our view of this, uh, Paul spoke a little bit about this already. Our view of this is that the polls are telling us uh, a version of our country right now that we have to take seriously. I don't mean you have to believe it all. I don't mean you have to agree with it all, but we have to take it seriously. Um, 
Uh, the middle number has actually changed as of last week, or as of 10 days ago. We should have updated this. Um, uh, in, uh, I believe it's September 2021, the, po the Gallup poll showed 52 percent of Republicans, and I think it's 41 percent of Democrats, want their state to secede from the United States of America. Roughly half of us no longer want to participate. We want a divorce. We want to separate. It's over in the eyes of basically half of the American people. Uh, many people think we're living through the worst era since the Civil War. One in four of us have already, so if you look around this room, if you were representative of the country, probably 15 or 20 of you would have ended a relationship with someone you love or someone you know well. Why? Because of the division in the culture. So this is no longer simply a matter of Republicans and Democrats or conservatives and progressives or coastals and, and heartland people not getting along. It's now in our families. It's ripping us apart. I think it's also one of the reasons why one of the many epidemics we talk about now is an epidemic of loneliness. Why? When you tear people apart, when you make people unsafe, when you make people feel uh, unwelcome by others, what do you find? You find loneliness. Almost half of Americans uh, say today that they're either frequently or always lonely. One of the great negative indicators of mental health and biological health outcomes is loneliness. Uh, and so it's not just political. This is personal. The health and safety uh, of us emotionally, mentally, even economically, is now at stake. Th th these, these numbers are several years old. Uh, if you look at the next slide, you'll see these numbers. I, 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 was, I was thinking I would block off the date of this because there's almost, it feels like a recent discovery that actually our political and media forces are benefiting. There's an incentive structure to make us misjudge and hate each other. You can say, how could that be? We're good people. Are there good people that work for MSNBC and Fox? There are good people who run for political office. There are good people who uh, represent the media and the culture and stuff like that. Yeah, there are good people, but all the incentives make them more likely to scare the heck out of you. Because if they scare you, you come back for more. We all do. And the more they scare you, the more you come back. And the more they make you feel there, those people uh, are horrible, the more you depend on them to remind you of the strength of your group. Now, that's not a psychological profile. That's a business strategy. I just want to be clear here. There's lots of ways to look at this. But I just don't know that we've yet reckoned with the financial incentives that exist to make us afraid of one another. And so, uh, one of the things Tammy and our team, Republicans and Democrats, scholars and young people, all kinds of different people, found when we talk to people about those people in the other party, now I don't, I don't know whether you're going to like this or not, we all, both sides use the same language. And almost the same sentence structure at times. So you'll hear very conservative folks or very liberal folks say this exact language about the other group. Now that doesn't mean both are right or both are equal. So some people will say, wait a second, are you saying that their values, that you're trying to tell us we're equivalent? No, I'm not saying your values are equivalent, your principles are. Your strategies are equivalent. <laughs> Big difference. The strategy for advancing the political or social or cultural aims has been largely truncated and made into a hate-based strategy. We win if you lose. You win, I lose. I win if I crush you. Just get on the mailing list of someone in the other party. I dare you. Doesn't matter what party you're in, it makes no difference. And get on one of the party you're in. And watch the exact same messages coming to you. 
except with a different uh, ending. Uh, the, the headlines in the, in the email will say the same thing. You can't believe what they've done. Now, I get these emails because, I, I mean, I'm trying to pay attention to this stuff. So you, get, you can't believe, and, and then you open it up, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter what party it is. Same thing. So this is making us believe that the only way we can advance our principles is by crushing people who don't agree with us. Uh, I dare say a fundamental violation of the core values of almost every religion in the world. And we do it almost without awareness. All of us. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I point the finger at myself. Now, here's a different way, therefore, of looking at what's going on. Because many people will say this crisis is political. Many will say it's economic. Many will say it's a function of the internet. Uh, some will say it's a function of migration, change, demographics. Uh, the rise of new classes of empowered groups, women, people of color, you name it. Uh, many will point to all those factors in saying this is why we're so divided. Uh, this is why civic engagement is weakening. This is why we can't uh, make progress on problems. Our premise is that this is a cultural crisis. That the crisis we're facing right now is that the norms and values and rituals of ultimate meaning, purpose, and belonging are so weak, and that when they are so weak, we are no longer strong enough to trust and navigate and find common ground. So if you and I operate in different universes of meaning or no meaning, I'm threatened by you all the time, so your ideas just become a lightning rod for my fear. Right? So if you don't have a strong enough cultural foundation, uh, a strong enough what some people in the anthropology world call superordinate identity, if there's, you, you, there's questions on this, uh, are, do you, are you proud to be an American? Very low numbers. What do you associate with your identity as an American? Unknown answer. So the identity that would allow us to hold the whole together and operate towards common ground, to find common ground, even to disagree on, common, on, on things, uh, is so weak uh, uh, that it's almost impossible to navigate political or economic or social challenges. So I'm leaving this it's, to some extent over the next few years with your generation the time, the challenge to build new, I don't say old, I don't say to return. Maybe some people would say to return. I don't believe that's, that's necessarily the challenge. I don't think it's ever been the challenge in any culture. The challenge of every cultural moment is to find the new skills, the values, the sustained meaning, capable of creating a new wholeness. We're not going to be able to do it with the old ones, and we certainly can't do it without attention to these skills and values. So. Uh, the, the story is in some ways told simply in the Cherokee proverb. Some of you may have heard it. The child goes to the elder, asks the elder, uh, some days I feel so good, some days I'm happy, some days I do the right thing, other days I wake up, I'm, uh, I'm grumpy, I'm angry, I'm sad, what's going on? And the elder says to the child, there are two wolves within you, a good wolf and a bad wolf. And the child says, which wolf is going to win? And the elder answers, the one you feed. So our question, uh, our question to the country, the question we hear coming from the country, and which in some ways we're bringing back to the country, is how do we feed, how do we build the superstructure, the incentives, the food for this emaciated good wolf that's within all of us, and reduce the overfed uh, aggressive bad wolf, so to speak. So we've identified good news. And the good news is that a lot of people are doing this already. And we call them uniters. Uh, we've looked at them, and I'll say a little bit more about this through history. We've identified at least three. You could, you could skin this. Uh, you, could, you could describe this a lot of different ways. But at least three qualities in people who 
are feeding the good wolf culturally to create common meaning, common purpose, common belonging. Here's three things they almost invariantly tend to do. Number one, they see the dignity of the other as a given. You don't earn my respect. You don't, well, I shouldn't say it that way. You don't earn dignity. Nobody. Let's just say in this room there are dozens of different positions on any issue. The uniter will not question your dignity. The uniter sees everyone's dignity as the foundation for common meaning. And so even as they might not agree with your positions on any number of things, and even as they might not agree deeply with your positions, even if they might be viscerally opposed to things you believe in, they will not try to rob you of your dignity. Number two, these folks always cross divides. They never try to win one side only against the other. They're always looking for the bridge. They're always trying to find ways. They're reaching out. We've just come from talking to the folks in Best Buddies here uh, uh, at, at Brigham Young, the folks that are involved in Special Olympics. What is Best Buddies if not people who say, I w I'm willing to reach out? You are not the same as me. You are not in the same university. You do not have the same test scores. You do not have the same economic prospects. And I'm reaching out anyway in friendship. Why? Because I trust, I believe, I am committed to your dignity. Now, that's maybe an easy example. Real uniters take on tough issues and still cross divides. Third point, I'll go more quickly now. Uniters tend to look for ways to solve problems that are transformational. They don't look to solve problems in an us against them. I don't look to solve the problem by making you feel uh, like uh, I, we, we beat you. They tend not to want to solve problems with 51% of the vote. They tend to want to solve the problems with large pluralities. If it's a community problem, can't we get everyone together? If it's an if it's a economic problem, isn't there a way to solve the problem for everyone as opposed to a small group? So they see that everyone's purpose is bound up in everyone being a part of solving the problem. That if you find your deepest purpose, you will not find your purpose at the expense of the other. So you say to yourself, well, that all sounds good. Uh, is it possible? The answer is, think back to the cultural question. It's not only possible, it's happening. So here we've done, and we haven't published this book, but uh, it, it, it won't be a bestseller, but it'll be important if we ever do it. We went back and looked through American history to find people who had addressed moments of cultural crises, absence of shared meaning, absence of shared purpose, absence of belonging, and transformed those moments. So you see here uh, lots of different examples, everything from Special Olympics in the upper left-hand corner to the Apollo program to the Environmental Protection Agency to Head Start. A lot of these look governmentally skewed, so you might be thinking, well, wait a second, what about how faith-based communities, are? There, there's a whole other slide of those. Uh, but you can see that people have done this, and we as a country have done this. People say we can't do it. That's just not true. Not only is it not true that we can't do it, it's not true that we aren't doing it. The story we tell, which eviscerates meaning, makes you think it's not true. Why? Remember the beginning? Because people would get paid if you're scared. This story actually disintermediates an economic interest. I'll give you just one example. I'm going to run over now, I'm going to, but I'm going to just uh, stop for a moment. So we're in the midst of, uh, on Veterans Day, uh, uh, our veterans, the poll came out today by our friends at, uh, uh, that uh, just finished it at uh, uh, More in Common, thank you. Um, that shows our veterans from the Afghan war to be struggling mightily. But you know what they agree on? They agree on the importance of welcoming Afghan refugees to this country. 
They want to be on the front lines of serving Afghan refugees. You know who else agrees? Progressives. You know who else agrees? Moderates. You know who else agrees? Conservatives. You know who else agrees? Faith-based institutions. You know who else agrees? Global multilaterals. Uh, the whole gamut of hate it, of parties that absolutely are at each other's throats all agree that we've got 100,000 Afghan refugees on military bases today, and I bet if I went around this room, half of you would offer to help if you could. Where's the story? I bet none of you have heard it. Why? It doesn't pay. It's not going to scare the heck out of you. So right in our midst, right now, the best of our country, our veterans, combined with the rest of us across all these divides, is ready to go to work. And you, most of us, will never hear about it. Further eviscerating our sense of co common meaning and purpose and belonging in a moment when we, it is sitting right there in front of us and most of us are dying to put ourselves into it. Couldn't we in our church, couldn't we in our Rotary Club, our Lions Club, I, I met with the heads of Lions, all of them, they want to have Lions Clubs around the country, volunteer uh, to serve the Afghan refugees. Anyway, sorry, that wasn't part of the pitch, but here we go. Here in Utah, uh, these are the initiatives of the First Lady of your state, Abby Cox. Service projects, social and emotional learning in schools, I'll say a little bit more about that. Making sure there are no foster children that don't have foster homes and Special Olympics unified sports. Every single one of them is designed to bring people together. Uh, is there a political, I'm not, maybe I shouldn't say this, is there a political win uh, uh, for uh, the First Lady? Uh, maybe indirectly. It, are, is this Republican project? Absolutely not. Are these projects for people who live in cities as opposed to rural communities? Definitely not. Is these projects for people who like masks and people, or, or, or not for people who don't? Absolutely not. All of these projects right now, the priority of your state, your political leadership, are designed to bring people together. How often have you heard about them? It's not because they're good news, it's because they're culturally unifying pieces of news. So, uh, the First Lady, one of, her, one of her initiatives is what we call social and emotional learning. Now, that's gotten a little bit of press the last couple of weeks, people getting upset or concerned about it. Here's one of the more, uh, and, and guess, guess what happens when people get upset? It's all over the headlines. Uh, just last week, I was told uh, the, the, that uh, social and emotional learning is uh, involved in teaching. I'm not even going to get into it. So here's one of the radical lessons. Uh, this is how we teach second graders uh, how to regulate their emotions and how to build confidence. Uh, you guys can all do it with me right now if you want. You just, it's very complicated, but if you, if you jo just join me, you can put your pens down. You can put one hand on one shoulder and cross your arms. And you could even imagine for a quick second here a moment in which you were angry or something you're stressed out about right now. And then imagine yourself going into your shell. You can close your eyes if you're comfortable and drop your head down into your shell and take three slow, deep breaths. And you can give yourself what we call a little positive self-talk. I can handle this. I'm a good problem solver. I can manage my emotions. And when you're strong enough, we teach the kids, you can come back out of your shell and open your eyes and solve the problem. Now, good news, you can also teach this to high school students. So here's, here's an example of, a, of a, a, a ninth grade lesson from the School Connect program. It's called How to Disagree Without Being Disagreeable a primary foundational skill of effective uniters who build culture rather than have culture wars. Some people want to have culture wars. We want to have culture builds. So here's the, this is just a snapshot of the lesson on how to disagree without being disagreeable. And you can see on the right-hand side here, uh, 
Number two, I'm not, not going to go through the whole thing. You can see one of the lessons centers on President Lincoln, another centers on an Eastern Sensi, a, a wise uh, a teacher from the East, uh, and the, the five skills of how to disagree without being disagreeable. The second one, does it resound, are you hearing a, a, a current theme here? Uh, presume positive intent. Another way of saying this is, Tammy, even if we disagree, I respect that you have dignity. I will not violate your dignity. I will presume that you are trying to do something good. Now, this is ninth graders, so if it's too advanced for our Congress or for our Senate, uh, uh, people will say, well, this is not going to, I mean, uh, are you kidding me? Well, guess what? It's very teachable. Most of us learn this in our homes at some level. If you have brothers and sisters, at some point, a uh, little less in my family, we stop, you stop fighting and you start figuring out how to solve problems. Uh, so these are skills that the First Lady is advocating for the state of Utah, all being taught around the country to young people, so that why? As one young woman said to me when we did our focus groups, uh, we don't have bullies anymore in our school, she said to me. This is a middle school in Iowa. But she said, you know what? I think adults are bullies. So we can, we can do this. And we have shown, in fact, I, we also, uh, First Lady knows this, when you do this work well, not only do kids become happier, not only do they flourish, you use the word flourishing, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, not only do they increase their attendance, but guess what? Their test scores go up. Wow, shocking, right? Their grades go up. Why? Because they feel safe, they feel valued, they feel seen, they feel in control, they find their purpose, they want to learn. Terrified, meaningless, no purpose, you don't want to learn. So uh, I'm going to skip uh, just for a second before we start the video. Uh, this is a short video, we'll, we'll, we'll rush through this uh, a little bit, but uh, this is a short video about a school in Rhode Island which used many of these skills that bring people together and used them and applied them to a couple of young leaders in their school who wanted to make the place safe for difference. Uh, this is the story of their work in this one school. Just a short three minute video uh, from Ponagan, so maybe we can show it if that's possible. There you go. Penguin? Patriots. Patriots, there we go. Yeah. Jason loves sports. Yeah, get a little speechless. Who do you like? Gronk. Say, Gronk. Everyone's curious, like, living with a person with disabilities, like, how daily life is. It's like, I don't know, just. Things like high school, 
So that when someone says to you, it's not possible, uh, you know it is. And deep down inside, we all know we can do this. If you listen to the words at the end, trust everyone to protect my brother, uh, we can do it in a school. Why can't we do it in a country? Why? Because he's no different than anybody else. We can do it for a person with a special need. Why can't we do it for a person of a different political persuasion, a different civic club, a different faith? The answer is we can. We absolutely can. Uh, but we need the narrative, and we need the leaders, and we need the people to stand up and say, I am no longer going to be in the hate and contempt machine. I'm not saying you shouldn't have your principles. But I'm saying you shouldn't use hate and contempt and destruction to bring them to life. And I don't believe we can stay together as a country unless we change that strategy. So I want to ask you, I'm going to tell you this is in politics. I don't have time to go into the Millennial Action Project, young state legislators and Republican Democrats who are working together. Uh, but here's, here's my challenge. We, we want to create a news beat. We want to create stories. I know many of you will have, are looking for projects. Uh, I, I want to put the challenge to you in this slide. I'll leave it behind if anybody wants to. So we want to tell the stories of people uh, who are learning how to be uniters instead of dividers, who are learning how to master the art of bringing people together. So there's people on this campus doing it right now. Maybe there's people in this room doing it right now. Let's tell the story. Let's put it on our Facebook pages. Let's put it on our Instagram. Let's, let's put it on the YouTube. Uh, Tell the story of when contempt backfires. You know, when someone was lo at loggerheads and full of hate and spite and contempt, and some, somebody else won, uh, some, uh, a transformational solution took place? Let's tell that story. You see, it didn't work. It didn't work. It never works. It never works. If you want to bring people together, if you want to create justice, if you want to create freedom, if you want to follow the beautiful prayer you started us with, uh, that we might respect each other, that we might learn from each other, that we might grow with each other, that we might do so under uh, this sort of umbrella of a larger faith, a larger presence, a larger salvific power almost. Yes, that will work. Hatred won't get us there. Never has. So there are organizations all over the state who are trying to do this. I've talked about specs a little bit. Doesn't put it in its mission statement, but it's trying to bring people together. Let's cover the story. Let's find out why the BYU Best Buddies volunteers are doing it. What's their story? What's deep behind it? Why did you choose to cross the bridge? Why did you want to cross this divide? How can we use these skills uh, beyond this? So uh, uh, we don't have this yet. We don't have the unity news beat. We have uh, all of our newspapers have the economics beat and the sports beat and the culture beat and the fashion beat and the politics beat, the crime beat, the war beat. We don't have the unity beat. 
Uh, so we're looking for volunteers. So if anybody wants to help us figure out how to do this, how to study neuroscience, social emotional learning, who's learning how to do this? Who's teaching it? Who's practicing it? We want to know. So uh, this is just an offer to all of you uh, as a challenge. And just to let you know that there's a lot more going on here than we see. This is an event that led to the book. Uh, the, the book came out of this uh, vi 25 hours of video we did last year with people from all different walks of life. And, and these are some of the famous people, but we had homeless women on this 25-hour uh, streamcast. Uh, we had children. We had dancers. Uh, and uh, about two-thirds of them are in the book that you, many of you have a certificate from. Uh, so here they all are. I don't know if we have, if we want to do questions, I don't think we have time because I think people are done, right? You're about to, the, uh, this is about to be over. So uh, we'll send you the highlight reel if you want to watch it. It's three minutes long. It's fantastic. You will see people you don't agree with. That's a good thing. Because you will see their dignity, their positive intent, their desire to do something good for the country. And you will see that there is something in them, even though you disagree with them, that we can work with uh, together. So I'm going to skip the video and just leave you with this closing. Oh, can we go to the next slide? Sorry. So um, as a way of closing this, I'm going to see if I can get volunteers. Um, there's about, I think, seven or eight sentences. And I'm not going to do this methodically. I'm just going to see if we can just, one of you, just pick the first sentence, and then when that sentence is, you start us off, and then if you're comfortable, just chime in if you're willing to read a sentence. Will you start us? We're tired of hostility. We're starving for unity. We're telling a new story of who we are. We are all connected. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's OK. Yeah, we are all connected as one people. We find joy in each other's journey. We find purpose in each other's happiness. We find belonging without excluding. We seek forgiveness. We find our dignity, our identity without othering. We feel called to unite. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your attention and for uh, being a part of this uh, today. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.